Okay, welcome to another video on uh, for IB history. This video is going to focus on why FDR um, had such a problem with the Supreme Court, and then why and how and why he chose to deal with it. And then we're going to look at um, just his power and the, his use of power, and just and ask some questions about that at the end of this video that we'll then take up in class. Why is Roosevelt making the comment about the courts? Uh, what does the judge mean by a note of criticism? Take a look at this cartoon. You notice um, the judicial branch also is asked by the people to do its part in making democracy successful. Uh, the Supreme Court wound up declaring a lot of the different New Deal laws and state laws that were similar uh, unconstitutional. And so FDR had to, was very frustrated at the end um, with the court and made some speeches against it. And that's why uh, I think the judge is asking that. So we look at this next cartoon. Um, you'll say, listen, I don't like your decisions. From now on, you're going to have to work with someone who, I, who can see, the, see things my way. Um, obviously, a baseball player arguing with an umpire is a classic American scene. But down below, you will see um, the New Deal Acts declared unconstitutional. You'll see the AAA and the NRA. Why are those important? Because those are two of the major parts of the uh, New Deal. You also see tax refunds, uh, regulation of shipments, original railway pension act, wage hour and regulations within the Guffey Coal Act. Um, and you'll see things that are, that are put out that were a big part of what FDR wanted to do in the New Deal. So the problem, in the lower courts, there was no less than 1,600 injunctions against the New Deal. And all an injunction means is that the court says you have to stop what you're doing. Um, and so what had happened was that the lower courts, the federal courts, um, who were also filled with conservative justices, because to this point, I mean, before Roosevelt, it was pretty much Republican presidents all the way back to, to Wilson. And so there's a lot of really conservative judges in the lower courts as well as uh, in the Supreme Court. And so they were putting injunctions against all, uh, against New Deal laws, but also state laws that were similar, looking for minimum wage, all the types of things that the New Deal was doing. There were also things in the state laws, and those were being declared or stopped, uh, meaning that they can't uh, use those or can't be moving forward with these laws. Eleven out of the 16 alphabet laws were decreed unconstitutional. And so to this point, basically, FDR is running into a roadblock. He can't go forward with his hope because at this point, almost all of most of his uh, things are going wrong. Most of his laws are being declared unconstitutional. And so here is Roosevelt's response. When any judge of a court of the United States appointed to hold his office during good behavior, he has hereto or hereafter attained the age of 70 years and has held the commission or commissions as a judge for any such court for at least 10 years, continuously or otherwise, and within the six months thereafter has neither resigned nor retired, the president for each such judge who has not resigned or retired shall nominate and by with advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint one additional judge to the court to which the former is commissioned, provided that no additional judge shall be appointed hereunder if the judge who is of retirement age dies, resigns, or retires prior to the nomination of such an additional judge. The number of judges of any court shall be permanently increased by the number appointed thereto, nor shall any judge be appointed if such appointment would result in more than 15 members of the Supreme Court of the United States. If you take a look at this document, what is it saying? What is the main point of this document? You can pause the video right now and take another look and see if you can come up with it. Um, also, based on OPVL, what is this? What is this? What is the value and, and limitations based on origin and purpose for us as people who are looking at this, this document as historians? And so I think Therefore, um, we need to look at the main point, and I think it has to do with this age of 70 years. Basically, Roosevelt said the court is overworked, um, and although most of the court responded that they were doing just fine, and they were uh, as far as times, but 
Roosevelt didn't want to say I'm packing it because I, they disagree with me. I'm packing it because they're not working with me. And so he goes about it that way. So the main idea of this source is that when you look at the age 70 and the fact that he gets to add a judge for each person that's over 70 and there's already uh, six of those judges in the court, we are now looking at a Supreme Court of 15 judges. Now there's nothing in the Constitution um, that limits the judges to nine. That's actually Congress's ability. They have the ability to add or take away from the judges that are in there. But there is something powerful about legal precedent. There is something powerful about the way things have been. Um, and so when people start seeing this idea of court packing, there is a question in their mind of, are you changing the Constitution? Are you basically getting rid of the checks and balances by knocking out the Supreme Court? The number of judges of any court shall be permanently increased by the number there, too. Now, permanently increasing, I mean, was that we now have 15, but the law leaves it open so that we could have, like, 25, 30, 40. Um, and so that's going to make it quite difficult uh, moving forward. So this is the law. This is a, a excerpt from the law. And we can see that Roosevelt's going directly after the court and firing back based on the way the court has really taken on the New Deal. And in some ways, I think we have to start asking our question, did the court overstep its bounds? So let's examine that. All right. As you can see here, this is making fun of the law. You have the Supreme Court and then you have uh, six FDRs in the background. Uh, this act shall take effect on the 30th day after the date of its enactment to Congress. Congress is looking somewhat shocked. Roosevelt's handing it to him, and then you've got the Roosevelt judges in the back. So, this is Roosevelt's solution to his problem, Judiciary Reform Bill. 70 would be retirement age for judges, and he could point up to six new judges based on the retirement age. Um, or that once they get over the retirement age, you can appoint a new judge, not that they would have to retire. Um, and so that's really takes a, um, takes a shot right at the Supreme Court. Okay, so then after that's done, we take a look at this cartoon here. We have government reorganization, Supreme Court revision, and the chair of the dictator. What is meant by the comments on the steps? And why is the chair labeled dictator? So take a minute and try and answer those questions, and then let's have a conversation about them. Okay, so now, what is meant by the comments on the step? Obviously, with the New Deal and the federal government taking a much bigger step, a much bigger step into people's lives, a much bigger um, role in people's lives, and then you've got this idea that now he wants to to revise the Supreme Court, who is hurting his government reorganization, you now have this fear of all Americans that goes back to the start of the Constitution, to the Revolution, of having one person with too much power. And so, although <clears throat> I think we can say um, that the idea of dictator is a little far-fetched, at the same time, you've got Congress has done everything Roosevelt's wanted, and now by kind of eliminating the Supreme Court as a critic by adding six of his people that would support and go with him, you now have a situation where um, maybe the dictator labor label fits. All right, executive branch suggests legislation. The judiciary branch determines constitutionality, Congress legislates programs, and you can see how they go back and forth with the checks and balances. The issue is that it used to be Congress that would come up with legislation would then um, enact and then the president is in charge with enacting that legislation. But with FDR and with the challenge of the Great Depression, you see a shift in that a little bit where the executive branch starts suggesting much and much more of what becomes legislation. And so you've got this situation where you have um, this thing where people are now in this in this role. You also have the judicial branch um, here, which then can censor the president, can discipline the president, but also can um, take laws that were passed by Congress and say that they're unconstitutional. And because the Constitution, um, you can interpret it open-ended or you can interpret it literal. Either way, 
you can interpret it in a way so that your politics, your view on things, can then determine what's constitutional and what's not constitutional. All right, sick chicken case. Uh, Schechter Poultry Corporation versus the United States, May 27, 1935. Um, I love the label, uh, sick chicken case. But anyway, so what happened here is that um, basically a, a poultry company sold bad chicken. Um, and they were, um, and this guy was taken to court for it, but it was under the national, it was under NIRA, National Industrial Recovery Act, especially for the National Recovery Administration, um, and that's what's declared unconstitutional here. Uh, Roosevelt's Poultry Court Code uh, fixed the maximum number of hours poultry employees could work, imposed a minimum wage for poultry employees, and banned certain methods of unfair competition. Schechter was charged with selling sick chickens. He proposed to uh, purchase live poultry from commissioners in New York City and Philadelphia that had been declared unfit. Basically, those commissioners said, you can't sell this in New York City or Philadelphia. He then slaughtered the poultry and sold it to retailers and butchers in Brooklyn. Um, and then they sold that pol poultry. And so basically he's putting, um, making a profit off putting unfit chickens um, for sale. Schechter Corporation for the United States of America. All justices, including the liberals, agreed that Naira was unconstitutional. Now, how, how can they say somebody selling sick chickens to people is unconstitutional? Well, the idea here is that sweep, um, that they're saying that this is a local problem. And that the idea here is that the government, that legislative power to create codes, to create laws, should be with the legislature and not with a president organization like the NRA. They shouldn't be able to set codes that fix all these different things. And so basically they throw out the NRA. Where FDR found the danger here, and I think that there's something to this, is that, um, is that he felt like, how could the federal government seek to uh, review any national or to recover or deal with any national economic problem if this definition of interstate commerce is so narrow. Who is, uh, so the idea is if, if it is so narrow, if it is, if, because creating the chickens is a local process, if uh, growing things out of the ground is a local process, then where, then what is interstate commerce then? And it's basically saying that Roosevelt could only get the chickens when they were being transported in no place else. But yet this was a unanimous decision because there was a uh, feeling in the court that uh, Roosevelt had overstepped his bounds with that law. But then we get Butler versus the United States, June 6, 1936. The AAA benefits from a tax on commodity processors. A uh, 6 to 3 decision the tax normally allowed was used coercively to regulate ag production and thus unconstitutional. Um, and I think what we see with, with Butler is this idea that these benefits were paid from proceeds of a tax commodity processors. In a 6-3 to three decision, the Supreme Court found that while the tax itself was justified under the General Welfare Clause, the Constitution, it was intended to use coercive and thus unconstitutional. Uh, the AAA violated the Tenth Amendment by attempting to use the taxing power to regulate agricultural production, a matter that the court said was part of the state. And so when we look at the Constitution, the Tenth Amendment does say that any power that is not declared to the federal government is state power. This is being very, very narrowly viewed by the court at this point. Um, it was strained, but its meaning was clear. The production of agricultural commodities was a local activity, not interstate commerce. Therefore, Congress could not use the taxing powers. So who is this Supreme Court that's creating all these issues? Uh, there was Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, who's a moderate conservative. Owen Roberts, who is considered somewhat moderate. Um, then there are the Four Horsemen, who were stalwarts of the laissez-faire system, who are as conservative as uh, Herbert, who, well, conservative as Calvin Coolidge. The believers that the government should do absolutely nothing involving with the, with the idea of the, the economy. And so at this point, you've got these four judges that are totally going against the court. You've got these two... Judges Charles Evans Hughes and Owen Roberts, who were considered moderates. And then you've got the liberal minority, 
of Brandis, Cordozo, and Stone. So you've got a core three that are liberal, a core four that are conservatives, and then you've got two moderates um, in the middle, but they are going with the conservatives against, um, against FDR's New Deal. So another decision, and this decision I think gives us a really clear idea of what's going on. So there was a, a law uh, that was known as the Guffey uh, Snyder Coal Conservation Act. And basically what this law did was regulate prices, minimum wage, maximum hours, and fair practices of the coal industry. Although compliance was voluntary, meaning that companies could choose or not choose, there was a tax refund uh, that was an incentive for abiding by the regulations. Well, Carter sued his own company. He was a stockholder. He sued uh, his own company saying that they shouldn't have to abide by these, um, by these acts. And this created a, uh, a court case that, with other court cases on coal, went straight to the Supreme Court. The courts narrowed the ability of the national government to regulate the economy, but then also struck down state government regulation. And here is the sticking issue. They said, okay, that coal, taking coal out of the ground was a local activity. That means it has to be a state, that the state has to then... Um, regulate that. But then they struck down a similar state government regulation on coal. So they're saying that the federal government cannot regulate wages and all of that, but then they're, they're saying that the state can't either for other reasons. And so basically what the court is communicating through this law and, and the decisions on the state laws is that, no, you can't have laws on minimum wage, maximum hours, and fair practices, which to say that is to really stretch the Constitution now. Uh, way beyond where maybe it should be. And so the court here is practicing, um, basically doing everything it can to get rid of laws that are interfering with the economy. And that is going beyond the court power because that's almost like saying what laws um, should pass and what laws shouldn't pass, not based on constitutionality, but based on their political beliefs. And that is take, that means that the Supreme Court is trying to legislate, which then... Um, is an abuse of their power. So Roosevelt's course message, hear ye, hear ye. Uh, you see the pounding of the gavel on the, the bench here and the judges acting all fair. Now, are they scared? Probably not. Um, the justices are people that um, are not all that happy with Roosevelt for the most part. But what happens is the Senate um, rejects the bill. They basically, the public hates it, the Senate hates it, um, and Roosevelt takes a political shot for this one. Uh, at the same time, shortly after that, uh, one year later, um, or shortly after that, within a couple months, Washington State minimum wage law comes up, and only one year after declaring a similar law in another state unconstitutional, the Supreme Court um, upholds the, the Washington State minimum wage law. And so Washington State basically is the first one to be able to kind of um, show that the court had changed. So what was the result of this episode? Um, did Roosevelt receive victory in spite of the defeat of the bill? Was Roosevelt, or was Roosevelt's attempt to pack the court an abuse of power? Both of those questions are things that we are going to start class with tomorrow, or actually on Monday, to take a good look and, and really examine these. And then we're going to take a, a look at some other uh, primary source documents and see if we can't figure out exactly uh, what is going on here.